Please welcome our session moderator, Vice Chair Client Solutions, Edelman APAC, and member of IWF Australia, Michelle Hatton. If that will be like very calm and reserved. Then Good morning, <laughs> everybody. Like, you know. How are we feeling? We feeling happy? Hands up if you're happy. Woo! Well, over the past two days, we've reflected on our post-pandemic world, from the impact of climate change and our shared responsibility to tackle the root causes, the importance of creativity and design thinking to problem solve, to the geopolitical landscape, to the impact of innovation and the pace of change. <laughs> As leaders, there's a lot to navigate, and I'm sure you will all agree that sometimes it feels overwhelming. So in our final session, we're going to unpack why and how experiencing happiness could help us stay positive and build better relationships and connections to tackle these and other pressing issues. For six years now, Finland has been at the top of the rankings in the World Happiness Report, followed by Denmark, Norway, Iceland and the Netherlands. To determine the ranking, citizens of 137 countries were asked to imagine themselves on a ladder with steps numbered from zero to 10, with zero representing the worst possible life and 10 representing the best. They were then asked what step they personally were on and country results were then calculated. And what factors determine how happy a country and its citizens are? Why should we as leaders care about happiness? Now, before this conference, we were all invited to participate in our Global Members Leadership Pulse. And we asked you to answer this question. Do leaders have a responsibility to spread happiness? 74% said yes, 9% said no. But in a moment, you'll hear what our fabulous panellists think. So as a reminder, this is your last chance to ask questions in a panel conversation. So we look forward to receiving those. But here to address happiness with me, a distinguished professor of psychology at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, a former fellow with the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, chair of the Lancet's COVID-19 Mental Health Task Force and a co-editor of the World Happiness Report. Please welcome Dr. Lara Aknan. Please also give a very warm welcome to University Lecturer at Alto University, co-founder of Philosophian Academia, author of A Wonderful Life, Insights on Finding a Meaningful Experience. Philosopher and researcher, please welcome Dr. Frank Martella. So I think a really important place to start is perhaps defining what is happiness and why is it so important? And Lara, as author of the report, I think perhaps you could kick off this conversation. What is happiness? How do we define happiness? Sure. Um, so I study happiness as a scientist and I use probably what is one of the most leading definitions for what we as researchers call subjective well-being, which is this umbrella term uh, for the lay concept of happiness. And it's thought to comprise of kind of three key components. Uh, the first is the present, presence and extent to which people feel positive emotions. The second is the extent and the, ex the extent and duration to which people feel negative emotions. And then the third component is someone's cognitive life satisfaction, or uh, it's a more global, holistic measure of how you would evaluate your life as a whole. And so these three components form kind of the basis for the subjective well-being assessment. Um, no one scale actually captures all three parts. The subjective, the World Happiness Report, as I'm, I'm guessing we'll talk about later, focuses primarily, or at least for the country rankings, on this life satisfaction 
satisfaction measure, uh, which is often correlated with how much positive emotion you experience, um, but not perfectly so, because you can imagine that there are moments you're not feeling that great, but you're still satisfied with your life. Um, and even people who might not be so satisfied with their lives can also experience these brief bursts of happiness. You know, you could have a chocolate ice cream and not be happy with your life as a whole, but still be happy true. in the moment. Um, and Very so, true. yeah, these three, these three components go together. So that's, that's how I define and, and measure happiness in my work. And so does a lot of the field. Frank, we've enjoyed our week here in your fabulous country. How do you personally define happiness? Is it, you know, laughing and, and being happy all the time? What, what is happiness to you? Yeah, I, I guess I usually say that, you no. Know, instead of one happiness, there are these, like, several happinesses, or, like, happiness in a plural. So, like, as, as Laura, Laura said, that, you know, that one thing is about this more, this cognitive life satisfaction. So that's one thing that when we, we might be meaning when we say that people are happy. But then the other thing is, like, you know, when I'm saying I'm happy right now, then it's more about these, like, joyful feelings and so forth. So in that sense... Like when, when people ask from me, like, you know, are you happy or are, are you, or, or, or is Finland the happiest country in the world? I always usually say that define happiness world first, then I can answer the question. So that's the <laughs> philosopher talking that <laughs> let's define the terms for first and talk only after that. So in that sense, there's like several different ways of defining happiness. I, I don't say like that one of them will be the right and one will be the wrong, but we need like this more holistic way of understanding the different dimensions of happiness. Lara. I was fascinated to learn that there even was a World Happiness Report. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure the audience would love to hear from you. Um, how did this come about and, and why does the world need a report on happiness? Sure. So this year's report, I believe, was the 11th edition. I've been involved heavily in the last three or four. Um, and it started just over a decade ago, born out of conversations at the United Nations and, and a global conversation recognizing that um, if we're interested in how people are doing, how they're living their lives, um, most of the indicators at the time were very much economically based. So GDP was one of the leading metrics of how people are doing, how countries are doing. Um, how communities are producing and, and, and what they're leaving behind. Um, and I think for a while that kind of served a purpose, um, but it was based on this, I think, incomplete understanding and, and perhaps um, a way of viewing the world that human happiness is more than just what it is we produce, it's about how we experience our lives. And so the World Happiness Report um, tries to fill that hole by doing a couple things. Every year it tries to publish some of what is the best of the well-being science out there. Um, and secondly, it has chapter two, which we've kind of discussed already. Um, is, is chapter two of the report is where you can see the annual rankings of life satisfaction around the world. Um, and so that, that, that chapter presents every year kind of some of the greatest insights and the metrics of what's going on. But I think it's based firmly on this understanding that we can measure happiness now. We don't need to triangulate and grope at this idea through alternative measures like GDP. We now have some really strong, valid, reliable assessments that we can ask people about how they're doing, how they're living their lives, um, and use that to form a greater understanding of, of how people are doing. Frank, I have to ask you, I think, a really important question because, you know, many of us have had some conversations um, over the week leading up to this session <laughs> about... Why is Finland top of the pops when it comes to this report? Because I'm sorry, this, this is a beautiful country and we have come here at such a beautiful time of the year. The sun is shining. There has not been a cloud in the sky, I think, all week. But we know that in months to come, it's going to be a little dark. <laughs> and cold. And cold and very cold. Yeah. So can you help us understand why is Finland such a happy nation when... It's also been reported that as a country, you know, you, you do have to deal with that darkness and there are dark times that are associated with that darkness. Can you unpack this for us? Yeah, because like, as regards this weather thing, I think that people, like when weather changes, it might have like influence on our happiness. The first sunny day after the long winter, that's probably when the Finnish people are quite happy. Okay, that explains it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that when you do the survey? <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the same time, I think like, people get used to the climate of their nation like, quite well, so like, it doesn't like, actually add, add, like, affect their well-being as, as much like, when, when you live in a country. So like, changes in the weather might like, affect your happiness for like, short periods of time, but like, living in a certain country, you get used to the climate, and that's kind of like, all you know, so then it doesn't like, actually have a big impact on people's happiness. So then the factors that actually are contributing to the Finnish happiness, we, like, 
we gathered together this like group of Nordic researchers a couple of years ago because we want like because it's not only Finland but the other Nordic countries also also like all the time the top ten. So we wanted to like figure out why why is that? What is the reasons behind? And it was like basically four factors that we like were able to like identify from the research. So one of them was like about this kind of quality of the institutions. So about like having this high like like freedom of the speech, having like free elections, low corruption, rule of law, these kind of factors. These seem to be factors that actually are, are like quite much predicting which countries are doing well on the survey and which countries are not doing so well. And when you look at these kind of like indicators, then low, low corruption and so forth, the Nordic countries tend to be in the top of the world also in those indicators. Then the other thing was like this, this like welfare benefits, like how much the government is supporting the citizens like through unemployment benefits, maternity and paternity leave, free healthcare, free education, and these kind of things. So again, like these are factors that seem to be according to research, contributing to people's average level of happiness in the nation. And these are factors that the Nordic countries are quite famous for having this welfare society model where people are provided with quite many services. Then the third factor is about kind of trust in other people and trust in institutions. So in those countries where people trust each other, where they trust the institutions, those again seem to be the countries which are doing very well on these rankings. And again, Nordic countries and Finland seem to be the countries where people trust each other quite much. So this Reader's Digest, one, at one point they had this study where they like left wallets on the street in like different cities around the world. Like huh. the, and then they, and in each wallet there was like this, like some small amount of money, and then there was the address of the person owing the wallet. So then they wanted to like see how many of the wallets are returned, and it turned out that Helsinki was the city where 19 out of 20 wallets were returned to the owner <laughs> with money intact. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So trust is the third factor, and then the fourth factor is about this kind of like freedom to make life choices, where actually these institutions and all play a role that you know in, in countries in the Nordic countries people have like more choice probably to think about their career, not only in terms of survival, but like in terms of what will be fulfilling for me. So this seems to be the fourth factor that we found out that would be contributing to these high levels of happiness. So it's not about the kind of like any cozy cultural story, but it's more about the boring institutional stuff. That not boring, not boring, important. <laughs> um, Laura, let's flip the conversation. The countries that are at the bottom of the ranking, what characteristics do they share? That's a hard question to answer. So this year at the bottom of the rankings in the 2023 report were Afghanistan, Lebanon, Sierra Leone, uh, the Congo, and I can't remember them all, but many of these countries share some important similarities, many of which uh, have been ravaged by war recently, internal or external, um, and have low levels of trust in government uh, and institutions. And so I think there's, there's some parallels, if you will, to what's at the top. Um, but one thing that strikes me, or I was thinking about this as, uh, before I came, is it reminds me of, I cannot paraphrase the quote, but it, there's a famous quote by Aristotle, which is about how um, sometimes there are many ways to get things wrong, but some more similarities in how people get things right. And so um, I think that's kind of, in my mind, how I think a lot about the World Happiness Report rankings, which is at the top, there seems to be some consistency in how many of these Scandinavian Nordic countries seem to top the charts year after year through high, high support, high trust levels in one another, through um, democratic systems and social safety nets, um, trust in one another, and, and the factors that Frank was just discussing. But at the bottom, there seem to be many ways in which, unfortunately, some countries can face challenges and flail, um, and that seems to be what we, we see in the World Happiness Report. Yeah. yeah. We were speaking just before. Um, Edelman does an annual trust barometer survey that really measures the value of trust and, and, and the importance of the currency of trust. And, you know, one of the really alarming findings that we found in the study pretty much everywhere in the world this year was this really concerning trend of polarisation. And, you know, it really is quite alarming when you look at the, the data that shows that in pretty much every democracy on the planet, Populations are deeply polarised, and that is now creating a sense of fear, a sense of uncertainty about people's economic future. So I'd love to unpack this concept of polarisation. And, you know, I think, especially coming out of the COVID pandemic, I think people have perhaps gone back into their tribes, back into their communities, 
I guess the question, and maybe Lara, for you is, how do we break this cycle now of people wanting to stay in their communities, but as a result of that, this deep polarisation, how do we cut through that? Because people aren't always happy in their tribes. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I have all the solutions on that, but I, I think trust is essential for building strong communities. It's essential for trust, uh, for, for, for happiness. But I also think it, it's a two-way street. So I think um, being social, being with other people helps build trust. I think when we are polarized and we kind of sit in our echo chambers in separate camps, we don't give other people the opportunity to surprise and delight us. Um, and I think a lot of the times we kind of hide behind doors. Um, one interesting thing, so Frank mentioned the really interesting Reader's Digest survey about dropped wallets and how they were returned. And there's, there's variability across the world with Helsinki being some of the top. But some other interesting data shows um, people's perceptions of how likely they are to have their wallets returned, um, which is a really great measure of to what extent you have trust in your neighbors, trust in your police and your local authorities. And that seems to be a really important predictor of people's well-being too. So it's not just the quality of the environment that you live in, but also your perception of that environment that matters a lot for your happiness. Um, and globally, one pretty consistent finding is that people really underestimate their neighbors. Um, almost around the world, people tend to underestimate the likelihood of their wallet being returned. And that matters a lot for our happiness, but it also matters so directly for our happiness if we don't think we can have enough trust in our neighbors that they'll return our wallet should we lose it, that's not great but it also undercuts, I think, what are some of the most important routes to happiness, which are other people. And so if we don't go out of our way to socialize with other people, um, we often find we have a lot more in common across the political aisle than we do. Um, people are a lot more civil and kind in person than we often show online, especially behind anonymous fronts. And so I think political polarization is, is a big concern, but I'm hoping that the more we come in contact with other people, um, we might have a little bit more warranted faith in one another. Yeah, and what, just a brief follow on that, like, I guess like one thing, like you can do, do that, like when you meet other people, of course, like that's like a good way of like getting rid of polarization, getting people together, get them to do something together. But then like you can do that also like on a like institutional level, like for example, like city planning in Helsinki and Finland has been quite much about like making sure that like, in a certain neighborhood, there will be like more expensive houses and more cheaper houses in the same neighborhood. So that people from like different socioeconomic classes would like meet each other, see each other on a daily basis. So that's like one way the Finnish society has tried to like build this, like or like make sure that the polarization doesn't grow. And the sense of community, I think, yeah. Well, that's that's worth it. <laughs> the sense of community, I think, we've all felt it during the week as we've you know met people on our journeys here in Helsinki. Frank, can you expand on that a little bit? You know, growing up in this country, what? How do you value community and what could we all learn from what you do as a nation around building community? When does it start? Um, it's hard to say, of course, like having grown in this country, I don't like it's, it's hard to compare like my childhood to like some, some other country. But yeah, I guess like one, one thing I, I, is already that, that I mentioned that, you know, that like tr trying to make sure that the city planning and other, the, the other planning make sure that like people from different walks of life meet together. So I guess like the elementary school system in Finland is so that people, there's not so much like the school shopping in, in Finland, but everybody goes to the same public schools. So it means that, you know, there's like no, not this like big distinction between like what's, that, that, what school you go as in, in, in your childhood doesn't like define where you're going to end up in life. So that's probably one I love way that. of like, making sure that, you know, <laughs> yeah. everybody has the same opportunities in life. Mm. Yeah, I love that very much. Um, Lara, we touched on this um, when we were talking earlier are there opponents of the study? Like, are there critics? Because one thing that I've learned in this conversation is there are a lot of people now researching happiness. It is a, it is a, it is a robust career now to actually research <laughs> happiness, which I found intriguing. So perhaps you could talk about that, but then also you mentioned that there are some critics. Why do they... What questions do they ask of you? Yeah, so the, the field of happiness has grown quite substantially in 30 years. I think maybe 50 years ago, there were maybe a few lone wolves doing this kind of work behind closed doors. Um, and over the past 30 years, it's really grown from just a, a handful of scientists to now a very robust, emerging, exciting field. Um, and I think it's, it's housed, I, we're both psychologists by training, and so I, I think that's the biggest home I see, but it's also you know spreading its tentacles into um, economics fields, into public policy policy schools into all these different um, 
it, it is interacting with a bunch of different disciplines and fields. That being said, I think given where the the, given the confidence that I think we have now in measurement and what we're able to do, I think the World Happiness Report is a testament of how we can measure happiness reliably and how it's predictive of important things. We have a much better understanding of what it is that facilitates human happiness and what are outcomes of human happiness. Um, but I am still surprised to see that very few countries assess life satisfaction in their census data. Um, one thing I learned from chairing the Mental Health Task Force for the Lancet COVID Commission was that there are great disparities in countries that actually ask these questions and those that don't. Mm -hmm. And the countries like the UK that has been doing this for 10 years had data to make data-driven decisions about how policies were influencing people's mental health and where the greatest disparities were and who needed the most help. And there were other countries that had no idea what they were doing and were just trying to triangulate from ad hoc measures that they, they could piece together. So I think while the science and the literature is showing that there is substantial promise in this field, I think there's a big lag in implementation and in policy uh, in policy informed decisions that are st there's still a gaping hole there. Yeah, I would think that when we think about societies, what, what, is, what is like the point of having a society? I think that one of the key goals of society should be like make sure that as many citizens as possible are happy and have like high levels of well-being. But, but still, like, I guess like many politicians are still not following these measures, so they are following these economic measures, but they should be also like, you know, measuring this well-being more carefully, and then also when thinking about various policies, think about like, the well-being consequences of those policies. So mm -hmm. there's lots to do in that area still. We have research, but we haven't gotten that to the politicians yet. Yeah, that's great. And Frank, here in Finland, are there critics of the study? So I know that... Um, you lead a lot of the media coverage when the report came out here in Finland. Do people ask tough questions? Like, how, how, how does it land in the nation? Actually, the, when Finland was the first time nominated the happiest country, I guess, like, the Finnish people were very critical about that. They were, like, saying that, no, <laughs> that cannot be true. No, because, <laughs> I, I guess, like... Kind of the self-image of the Finnish people is that we are like these like, you know, quiet and bit melancholic kind of people. So then suddenly people come in to tell that you're the happiest, didn't, like, <laughs> didn't fit at all. So I remember like, that, that people were very much like, looking like, to criticize the report, like looking like what, what is, there was this something wrong with the metro. <laughs> so it took a while for Finnish people to understand that it's, it seems to be that it's... You again, are happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so people were not willing to accept that. They weren't happy that they were happy. Uh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I guess like when one explains that it's not about you know this cheerfulness, but it's more about this like this quiet life satisfaction, being content, being content with your life. Then the people understand. That, okay, it might be more true in that sense. And then when, I, when one explains that it's more about, you know, it's not that there will be like more extremely happy people in Finland, but it's more about that there's like less extremely unhappy people given the institutions. So then people might be already understand. That, okay, in that sense, it might be more true that. Finnish people, that Finnish society actually seems to function relatively well in taking care of the citizens, and because of that, there's less like unhappiness in Finland than some other countries. That's a good way to frame it, um, Laura. There's clearly many people in the room here. You know, we've been tackling post-COVID work environments, and you know, obviously, the way we work, where we work, and how we work has fundamentally changed forever. How do you think that the new work environment will impact happiness in the workplace? I think work has a substantial role to play in people's happiness because many people spend the majority of their waking hours at work. And so I think how we structure work has uh, stands to have a very large uh, impact on people's happiness. So that raises questions about what is it about happy workplaces that seem to support uh, workers' well-being. Um, and there, thankfully, there's quite a bit of evidence on that. Um, some of it, I think, is pretty intuitive, and, and some of it might be more surprising. Um, so, for instance, large global surveys have found that um, employer, uh, employees tend to report higher levels of happiness when they have higher earnings, which perhaps is not surprising. Um, but there are also features that matter. Um, for instance, having more flexibility in your job and the opportunity to learn new skills seem to be really important for worker well-being. Um, as to uh, does a whole bunch of social stuff, which I think kind of resonates with what we've already been talking about. So for instance, trusting the people you work with has a huge impact on your well-being at work. Um, liking your boss and your colleagues has an important role. Um, in fact, there's a really uh, well-documented trend in the happiness literature, what they call the weekend effect, which is simply 
actually that most people are happier on weekends than they are on work days. That's, yeah, but <laughs> if you look at people who see their superior or their boss as a friend, not a superior, that weekend effect disappears. And so I think that speaks volumes for how, uh, for how the importance of our relationships at work. And also jobs that provide people a sense of meaning. They feel like they're improving either their coworkers or other people's lives, um, and also jobs that provide an ability to balance work and life. I think all of these kind of stand to promote greater worker well-being. Frank, one of the interesting learnings for me this week is understanding this concept of um, Sisu, inner strength. Actually, side story, back in Australia, um, a very dear friend actually launched a product and it's called Sisu. And now I'm going to go home and say, I now understand why you called your product <laughs> Sisu. Can you help us understand this national character that exists here? And why is it so powerful and palpable? Yeah, so Sisu is about like this perseverance in like when, when you like face like like big, big like obstacles in life. And I guess like it might come from like, you know, the cold weather and, you know, like quite, quite harsh conditions that Finnish people have been like, enduring in the past centuries when living in this kind of dark and cold place. So, of course, like nowadays we have the modern facilities, so it's <laughs> not so hard to live in here anymore. Mm -hmm. But like I can imagine the conditions like a couple of centuries ago, especially during the winter times. And also, like, I guess, like the Second World War when Finland was like fighting against Russia, and that, that, that generation was, took the Sisu quite much like as, as their thing, because, of course, they were like, you know, there was like one Finn against ten, ten people from, from, from Russia at that war. So probably that was like a moment when Finnish people really felt that, okay, we need some Sisu to survive, even like in this situation. So it has been like become part of like a national kind of like folklore quite much that Finnish people have this concept of Sisu. And it's something that we try to like tap into when we face something like insurmountable hard hardship in life. My friend's pro product is a tonic. <laughs> so I, now, I, yeah, I, I understand why she's called it Sisu. I love it. Um, can we talk a little bit about social media and the impact of social media on one's happiness? I think, you know, there's been so much reported over the years. Love to get your perspective on the importance of connectivity, the importance of community, but is social media impacting people's happiness? Frank, what do you think? Mm, of course, it's a complicated question in that sense. Like, you no know, people can use social media in different ways, and so it, it probably it, it can have like good effects. It can have like bad effects. So it's a, it's a good thing that you know that you can connect with people who are, are in a li different country. You can like keep in contact with them through that. You can connect with like people, like old friends who are like living in different city and so forth. So there's there's surely many like positive effects from that. But at the same time, it's also like especially like with young people, it seems that you know it's kind of like replacing this culture of like you know hanging together in the same place. So people. Uh, the children after the school, they go home and then they hang in the bad bedroom with their phone in their hand instead of like going somewhere together. And that probably can like be like undermine people's well-being because in the end, I guess like given the kind of creatures we are, we get like more happiness out of being in the same place with other people, being like in the same room with them rather than like communicating through with, with them with the phone. So there probably are like, on, like these detrimental effects of social media use that can be like, and there's a big debate about that right now in the scientific community, because mm -hmm. like there's, there's this clear in increase in like depression and other like negative well-being indicators for the young people, like in, in US, in Canada, in many European countries. So, and people have been like trying to figure out what is like key influence on that. And quite many researchers think that it, the social media is one of the key things that has like contributed to that. Mm. Do you see that as well? Yeah, I agree with what Frank said. I think one of the biggest concerns about social media is that it's replacing or it's taking up space um, for in-person connections and more meaningful connections. And I think one of the other major findings in the literature is just the social comparison effects, particularly in younger age groups. Um, people post their best selves, their most exciting experiences. It's their life's highlights reel on Instagram and Facebook and all the other things that I'm not cool enough to use. And so um, <laughs> what people see is the fun stuff and they don't see those, you know, long arduous mornings where, you know, you're getting up or you've got a new zit or you've got, you know, people are comparing themselves to what is a very unattainable alternative standard. And I think um, social media just provides an abundance of that. Yeah. Just to shift the conversation slightly, love to get your perspective on gender equality and does that play a part in countries' ranking when it comes to happiness? Do you see that at all in the report? 
Yeah, well, so the report has not really looked at gender equality and happiness, at least to my knowledge, over the past 10 years, but there is some evidence to suggest that it is, it is associated with well-being. So countries that have higher degrees of gender equality, as covered by many of the leading metrics, do report higher levels of happiness. Um, and interestingly, it's not just women's reports that are driving these effects. Um, men who live in countries with more gender parity are reporting higher levels of well-being. Um, and I think that's really important. I mean, I think that's actually a, a larger theme in the literature beyond gender equality, is just in places where there are fewer gaps, lower levels of inequality across the board, financial inequality, for instance, people seem to be better off. And it's not just bringing people up from the negative side of things, you know, relieves their tension and stress and anxiety and depression, but more people, just the larger population feels a greater sense of ease and camaraderie and trust and community when there are fewer disparities. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? at all in the recent Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with everything a lot of says. And I just want to add, like, I guess, like, one reason behind this might be, like, also this, this freedom to make life choices is something that seems, and this all, sense of autonomy seems to be very important for our sense of happiness. Mm -hmm. Then probably, like, countries that have, have more gender equality, also, like, you know, less strict gender roles. So, like, for example, like, in some countries, there's, like, much, much, if you're a man, this is how you should behave. If you're a woman, this is how you should behave. And this is kind of like restricting people. So if you have like countries where people have like more room to be themselves, no matter their gender or other qualities, then probably those are, they, those are going to be the countries where people are happier because then they're better able to live their life that they want to live. So that's, that's probably something like explains like why... <laughs> that's probably something that explains why also like men in more gender equal countries are doing better. I love that. Um, could we unpack a little bit what you think we could all be doing to improve our personal happiness. You know, love to get your perspective on what you think we can all be doing differently as we leave this room and the meeting this week. Any tips for us? Do you want to go first, did you? <laughs> yeah, it's like, of course, there's many things that, you know, research had like shown could be increased or happen. Like sometimes like trying to like, distance them down that, you know, Connect with, other, connect with other people and connect with yourself. So like connect with yourself in the sense of like, you know, making the life choices are actually your own, like based on your own values, your own interests, rather than you know, following some like external script or following what, what your parents want you to do, what the society wants you to do. And then connect with other people, like you know, these close relationships is usually like one of the key sources of happiness for most human beings. And then contributing, which is something Laura has like much research on is one key thing as well. I, I know I know you said if we have disagreements, I, know, I, I should raise them. I agree all the time. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, we agree on a lot of things. Uh, I, yeah, I, what, what Frank said, I think one thing I've tried to prioritize in my life, especially actually through with COVID settling and, and life reemerging in many of its more familiar formats, is to make more time for other people. I think at a distance, that always sounds like a lovely idea, but when push comes to shove, there are, I'm not going to lie, there are moments when a friend cancels plans and I kind of relish and like, yes, I don't need to go out tonight. Um, or, you know, I don't need... Um, but I, as, as someone, and I've studied this stuff for a decade and a half and I know how important social relationships are for our well-being. And so I've tried to make social things a greater priority and what I call pro-social things a greater priority. Um, I do a lot of work on how generosity can make people happy mm -hmm. um, and doing that in, and I think the main reason that is for the record is because it connects us with other people. Right. Um, giving to other people is a way to form and facilitate and build these social connections. And um, I think we know at a distance, this is a good idea. It sounds like a good idea, but sometimes when push comes to shove, we don't always make the social and pro-social choices. And so I try to sign myself up for you know, I'm on my son's parent-teacher school board thing, and I try to sign up for things in, in advance so that in the moment I don't cave to those very human weaknesses of laziness. And I think we can all relate to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I summarize that. I say that, you know, one of the best things, to, what, what's the way, best ways of making yourself happy is make somebody else happy. Kind of like that. When you do yeah. that, it actually yeah. makes yourself happy as yeah. well. Yeah. Thank you. I love that. I love that. I love that. So now we have time for some questions. Uh, the first one from Susan Young from the United Kingdom. How important are the arts as a contributor to happiness? Great question. Frank, would you like to take that? Here in Finland, you've got a wonderful creative and arts community. Does that help? Yeah, probably in the sense, like, you know, I, I said, like, you know, I think like one of the ways of like increase our happiness like, is connecting with ourselves and like, being able to like, express ourselves through our 
like doings in life. And so, if, of course, like if you're like like excited about certain forms of art, if you're able to like practice that just on your own or do, doing it, probably it has like a big impact on happiness. But probably that's like something that is like quite much depending on the person. So like you know, if I if music is a big thing for me, then music is going to be a source of happiness for me. But if somebody is not interested in music, then like pushing music to that person won't probably won't, happy. Yeah, yeah, won't, won't, won't make that person happy. <laughs> so in that sense, probably you need to like know what is the thing that makes your your th you tick, and then like give your give more do more of that. Yeah. Does that come through in the research at all when you think about yes. it? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, arts, uh, engaging in arts can be a very creative task, which mm. in turn can make people happy. But there's also some really fascinating research showing that, um, for instance, attending plays and even um, deeply engaging movies uh, can increase people's empathy, uh, which leads them to be more pro-social and connected to other people. And as we were just talking about, that kind of connection is a strong path to happiness. So I think the arts, like through these direct channels, but more indirect channels, can facilitate happiness. And it's also worth noting that the opposite appears to be true, that happier people tend to be more creative. Um, and so there's kind of this interesting bi-directional pathway between happiness and creativity. Which so might emerge. Definitely a really interesting theme around connections and through your connections, opening your mind to new experiences mm -hmm. will make you more happier. Yep. Mm. I love that. Next question from Julie from Nevada. In visiting the National Museum, there was quite a bit of information about depression, alcoholism, and suicide being problems of Finnish culture. How did you move from this perspective to happiness? I think we touched on this a little bit, but. Frank, may, maybe you can unpack this a little bit more for us, because this has been, as I say, the conversation this week amongst this group. Yeah, that's actually like, one question that I get often. It's like, you know, hey, given the highest suicide rates in Finland, what, what, how can it be the happiest nation? And I guess, like, the answer to that is, like, actually, that it used to be the case that the suicide rates, for example, were very high in Finland in the 70s and 80s. But actually, they have been, like, going down quite rapidly since that, and nowadays... It's not like the Finland will be the like best country in these, these regards, but it's like some, somewhere quite much in the European average as regards suicide rates and depression rates. So in that sense, I guess, yeah, they're, they're, of course, like Finland is not a perfect society. That, that's, that go, goes without saying that there's also like problems in the Finnish society. There's depression, there's alcoholism, there's suicide also in the Finnish society. So there's many people who are like also suffering. And I've understood that also that this, kind of like this gap has been like increasing a bit, that there's, most of the people are doing well, but those people who are not doing well, they're like doing worse than they used to be doing before. So there are also like problems that should be like, we, ha we need like somehow address mm -hmm. nowadays in the Finnish society as well. So the average is high, but that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be people who are also like suffering. And then we need to figure out what can right. we do as a society and as a community to help those people. And I think one of the opportunities for all of us would be to think about in our countries, how to close the gap, right? In terms of people who are genuinely suffering and as a result of that are feeling all sorts of emotions, including unhappiness versus those that aren't. And what, is there one thing that you think your country has done exceedingly well to try and close this gap? Mm, I, guess, I guess like, not, I'm probably not, not like best expert. I think that, that they're kind of like the ways to reach out to these people, like, you know, how, how they can kind of like various, like, you know, organizations can reach out to these people is like something that probably can, can help in these situations because people usually need, they need somebody they can talk to and they might, if they don't have like that person in their own life, then they need somebody, some professional person to talk to. And of course, like, you know, identifying those people and then like getting somebody who is like with them for a long enough time might be like one of the things that could help in those kind of situations. Yeah. Next question. From Barbara in California. It has been said that a correlation between the Nordic countries' happiness results and the fact that they are relatively homogenous communities, do you think that that plays a role? So diversity, is that important? I know Frank spoke to this in his chapter, so I'll let you would take the question. Yeah, so I guess like that's, that's another question that I often hear, and I guess like Based on research, it seems that it doesn't like seem to be like so big factor that we would think. And also, like the Nordic countries are actually like not so homogeneous that we might think. That for example, the Sweden, which is also in the like top top five or top top ten of the of the World Happiness Report, there's like 21 percent of the population has been born outside of the country. In Finland, it's somewhere somewhere around 10 percent. So there's actually like quite many countries which are more homogeneous than the than the Nordic countries, which are not doing so well. So 
I wouldn't say that it plays like so big role. And also, like I guess, like the World Happiness Report has shown that you know, also the happiness of the immigrants tends to like rise quite much to the level of the people who are living in a certain country. So people moving from a certain country to Finland or Sweden, their happiness levels tend to rise quite much, like closer to the national average. I don't know if yeah. Laura has like more to say. Yeah. No, no, I agree with you. I. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the homogeneity within a country might make it at some level face e easier to address with inequalities if you know that you're supporting the people in your neighborhood and they look like you, you know, superficially that might make it easier um, to know that a surprising or a, a substantial portion of your income is going to tax dollars to support the social safety net. But as Frank said, I think there's quite a bit of variability in the Nordic countries about how many um, what percent of the population are immigrants, and, and even in countries where there are higher levels that are on par with many of the countries around the world, we do see people still topping the rankings. Next question. From Molly from Jamaica. Is there a correlation between the GDP measures and the happiness report measures? That's one for you, Lara. Yes. The short answer is yes. Um, income is uh, internationally and within countries. GDP seems to be a robust predictor of happiness reports. Um, but I think sometimes it is not as strong as most people suspect. Um, and so oftentimes we seem to think that, hap that, that income is one of the only and most direct routes to happiness, but actually one of, one of the findings in the World Happiness Report is that the social context matters approximately to the sim a similar extent. So for instance, there's one question that seems to predict average life evaluations really well, and that is what we call it our social support measure, but simply put, it's asking people if they have at least one person they can count on in times of need. And when people say yes to that question, it is one of the most predictive to their well-being. So yes, income certainly does matter, um, but there are a host of other things that also matter too. So what are some of the other questions that you ask in the survey? Well, it's actually not our survey. I should mention that. It's data collected by the Gallup World Poll, which is a huge international survey and does a fantastic job of getting internationally and, and nationally representative data of, of, that, is, that is representative of, I think, 95% of the world's adult population. And so we're fortunate to be able to use these data, but w they, they provide access to us, and then those responses are analyzed in, in, in the in chapter two of the report. Um, but we can use those questions in turn to predict the variation across countries, and maybe that, that would be a helpful way to answer the question. So I should clarify, because Frank and I were talking about this earlier, um, the, the rankings that are listed in chapter two, where Finland has been at the top for the past six years, are not, um, they're not our scientific approximations of what is the happiest country. That is exactly how the respondents within a nation have answered the question that you mentioned at the beginning on the scale from zero to 10 how would you rate your life? We simply take the average and then put them in order. Um, then we, as, as researchers, try to go in and try to understand the cross-national variation. What are the predictors of those variation? And GDP is one of them. Healthy life expectancy, um, trust, in, trust in the government, um, freedom to make life choices, the social support measure that I just mentioned. Do you have someone to count on in times of need? And, uh, and also, last but not least, my favorite, personal favorite, but I'm biased, is generosity. So have you donated to charity like in the that. past month? Mm. Do you predict changes in perhaps next year's survey, considering what is going on in the world? Frank, will Finland be top of the pops again, do you <laughs> expect? Yep. I think that there's relatively high probability that the Finland is going to be good because, like, the gap between Finland and the next one is like quite. Well, so there's competition for this report. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> but but the, the, the gap is like so big that you know usually the, the, the individual the, the differences between years is not so. The, it doesn't like easily move like from from one percent to the next. So yeah, I would bet my money on Finland, but it's <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yet. Well, we'll wait for next year's report to come out. Perhaps to close out. The session, you know, Frank, if there was one thing that you would like each and every one of us to take away from this session and our week in Finland around happiness, what would it be? What can we take away? Yeah, I guess, like, as, as I said, like, you know, we can do many things on an individual level, but at, at the same time, the happiness of people is quite much defined by the institutions. So in that sense, like if you're in a leadership position, make sure that you know, the institution that, that you're, you're part of is like somehow serving the people within the institution, like you know, making sure that people have like, are able to connect with themselves, like are able to 
express themselves and be, be themselves in the, in the organization, are able to do something meaningful with their time, and then also like connect with other people. So make sure that in your organization, people connect with each other, and also the people are able to do something good to the world, that they feel that the, what, whatever the organization is doing is something that makes the world a better place. So that's probably something that everybody can I love do that. to make. Thank you. Yeah. I love that very much. Laura, I know that you are very passionate about joy being linked to happiness and would love your thoughts on that concept and what we as a community of leaders can take away from the meeting. Well, I perhaps I agree with what Frank said about the importance of social and pro social finding social and pro social opportunities. I think there are other ways to improve our happiness, like we were just discussing. Um, but I think some of the most tractable and probably some of the most fun and enjoyable ways um, to find happiness are through other people and through helping other people. Um, and so I think it can sound like a broad truism, and I sometimes get asked for like specific advice on this, and it can be a little difficult because I think connection and pro-sociality can look very different across the world and in different communities and in different families and in different relationships. And so, you know, I have my own preferred ways and, and people might have their own. But I, th I think there are, some, there, are, there are some measures of consistency across people. Um, and so I have one suggestion we can you try. You do. <laughs> um, and you want to hear it. Yeah, okay. So Get ready, uh, everyone. Get ready. So uh, one common theme we've been talking about a lot during this session is the importance of social connection and pro-sociality. Um, and part of that comes from doing things with other people. And so one challenge, I was going to read the room and see the energy levels in here, and it seems like you're all very happy and engaged in here. We're up for it. Um, so um, one way to really build a sense of camaraderie and happiness is to do things together. So I was going to suggest we finish with a song. Uh, so yeah. Uh, this it's a is song we all know. <laughs> uh, it's inspired by another researcher who does this all the time, and people leave um, happy. So um, sing along if you know it, and don't leave me alone for long because I don't have a great voice. Uh, it's if you if you're happy and you know it. So <laughs> ah, there you go. So if okay, you're we ready? Oh, okay, we if you're happy right. and you, you know, know it, clap, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Thank you. Well, please um, join me in thanking our wonderful panelists, Frank and Lara. I think we're all leaving feeling, um, feeling really happy. It's been a great pleasure to have this conversation with Thanks. you. Thank you so much.